Good afternoon, everybody. If I could have your attention just for a few moments, that would be great. I attend a lot of networking events. I've never seen somebody, a group of professionals sit so fast. Everybody must be cold and hungry, which is, which is a good thing. But we're glad you're all here. My name is Jeff Pollock. I'm the current Georgia CCIM chapter president and thrilled you're joining us here today. Uh, I'd like to introduce Paul Ozzy, our president-elect, who's going to share a few words for an invocation. Uh, then I'll share a few remarks and announcements, and we'll introduce our speaker. So thanks again for coming. Thanks, Jeff. And, and yes, we're, we're, we'll do our invocation for what we have received and what we're about to receive. How about that? If you'd please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, the food that we're about to receive an opportunity to freely gather here today to learn about our economy and our great industry. We pray for the protection of our servicemen and women all over the world and pray that someday we will have peace. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that you place before us and pray that we will have the ability to recognize them. We are also fortunate in this room and we pray for those that are less fortunate than us. As we approach the holiday season, let us all remember those that are less fortunate and greet them with a servant's heart. Lord, we thank you for our many blessings and pray that you keep us safe as we leave here today to go make a positive example in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Again, welcome. We've got a dynamite speaker here today, and I won't steal any thunder, but I'm told it's going to be a, a good day for us, so I'll leave it at that. Um, no reaction, so that's good. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of our generous sponsors. We have a number of table sponsors here today. They're all listed in your program, so please reference that. And we have annual sponsors as a chapter. I'd like to list those for you. Their uh, contribution to the chapter allows us to provide programming all year long um, at a very affordable price, and uh, it's a very dynamic group. So we've got Marcus and Millichap. Ackerman and Company, Adams Realtors, The Simpson Company, Wells Fargo, Standard Landscape, Brand Properties, Bank of North Georgia, Excelligent, Anderson Tate and Carr, First Colony Financial Corporation, and Strategic Exchange Advisors. We hope you all will keep those folks in your business dealings in mind um, as they help us uh, have a great year of programming. So you're at the CCIM Economic Forecast luncheon. Many of you have been here for years before. Uh, for those guests that aren't familiar with CCIM, I thought I would um, give a very brief overview of what it actually is. A CCIM is a Certified Commercial Investment Member, and they are a recognized expert in the commercial and investment real estate industry. The CCIM lapel pin that many of us are wearing today uh, is a result of successfully completing a designation process that ensures CCIMs are proficient not only in theory but also in practice. The Georgia CCIM chapter is part of a national organization founded in 1954 and is now under the umbrella of the National Association of Realtors. The organization strives to give commercial real estate practitioners an opportunity to further their business practices through focused education, networking, and technology opportunities. There are 15,000 commercial real estate professionals in 30 countries that have earned the designation and currently 5,500 pursuing it as we speak. Here in Georgia, our chapter is over 300, and we have members representing all facets of the industry, from brokerage, appraisal, lending, law, and various vendors within the industry. Uh, if you have more interest in the chapter or learning more about our courses, I hope that you'll see me or one of our uh, board members will be glad to provide more information on that as well. One of the things that we do every year is we provide a scholarship to a Georgia State MBA student. Uh, it's called the Bob White Scholarship. Bob is with us here. Um, so I'd like to recognize Rob Kruer, if you please stand. He's the recipient of a $1,000 scholarship. He's an MBA student at GSU and is working in industrial brokerage um, currently and graduates in May. So he's uh, studying and working uh, at the same time. Uh, I'd also like to thank our very dedicated board of directors. Uh, we work hard all year to put on an ambitious program. They're volunteers, and we thank them. And we've got Katie Centel, who's our chapter administrator, who many of y'all have spoken with. Um, she checked in today. Uh, we couldn't run the organization without her. So thank you very much. I'd like to give her a hand. And with that, I'd like to introduce John Johnson, who's one of our 
a longtime chapter members who's going to introduce our speaker. Please enjoy your lunch, and um, we'll have you out by 1 o'clock. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce my friend and a very frequent advisor to Sperry Van Ness. Dr. Sam Shandon is president and chief economist of Shandon Economics. He's professor of the Associated Faculty of Real Estate at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, where he currently teaches real estate finance. He's also a columnist for the New York Observer. Sam's firm is a leading provider of commercial real estate mortgage data and analytical tools, including credit risk analysis tools and the industry first loan comps database. Prior to founding Shandon Economics, Dr. Shandon was global chief economist at Real Capital Analytics and chief economist at Reese. Among his industry activities, he is the national economist of the Real Estate Lenders Association, the chief economist blogger for Globe Street, and editor and co-author of Real Estate Finance, published by PEI. His textbook, Real Estate Finance and Credit Risk, will be published in 2014. Sam's commentary and analysis can often be found in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, on Blomberg TV, CNBC, and other leading media outlets. Dr. Shannon received his PhD in Applied Economics from the Wharton School and holds graduate degrees in engineering and public policy. He was a doctoral scholar at Princeton University and prior to Wharton was a visiting professor in the economics department at Dartmouth College. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sam Shandon. Well, hello everyone. I have to tell you, I uh, am uh, very much appreciative of the opportunity to join you again. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it was wonderful to you know, get the call from John uh, to ask if I'd be able to join you again. I really am thrilled to be in Atlanta. Um, I think it's fair to say that as compared to last year, compared to the year before, compared to the year before that, um, you know, the outlook and our sense of where the market is has improved. Um, I think uh, that when we look at you know, various measures of economic activity, when we look at the potential uh, for further gains in economic activity, when we look at the underlying drivers of commercial real estate property fundamentals, when we look at the availability of financing, when we look at the level of transaction activity in our markets, all of these things are pointing up to a 2014 that will be a stronger year for commercial real estate than the last year has been, certainly than the year before that. That being said, there are certainly also challenges for us and when we're thinking about how the market will perform over the course of the next couple of years and how it will perform over the longer term as well. What are some of the key questions that are going to face us over the course of the next year that we need to be thinking about that I think are really on the minds of a lot of people, whether we're in Atlanta or any other part of the country, when we're thinking about what will happen with commercial real estate in the next year and the ways in which the outlook for our industry is changing because of fundamental changes in the underlying conditions of what is driving the recovery for commercial real estate. Probably the biggest question on people's minds, and it has been really since May and June and July of this year, is how will our industry adapt to a change in interest rates? That's been on the minds of a lot of people for a very long time. Because when interest rates were 4%, there were a lot of folks who didn't believe that they could ever fall to 3 And when the 10-year yield was at 3%, there were a lot of people who didn't believe it could ever fall to 2 And then we arrived at 2 and we arrived at 1.5. And for a brief period of time, we were able to finance our acquisitions at lower rates than we had ever seen in our industry's history. But I think for a lot of us who have been through at least one cycle, we know that that is a temporary condition. And so one of the challenges that we face now, as the rate environment begins to change, is a challenge around, well, to what extent have improvements in value, have transactions, have financings relied upon the availability of cheap financing because we have not had access to very strong underlying fundamentals? Because that is something that has to change. To the extent that in some markets, in commercial real estate in some parts of the country for some property types, cheap capital has done for us what the economy has not been able to do. That implies that when we think about what 2014 will look like, we need to be thinking about it in a way that is very different from what has happened in 2012 and 2013. So how will interest rates and changes in the interest rate environment ultimately impact the outlook for our sector? If we need stronger fundamentals as the underpinning or the anchor of value because cheap capital ceases to be the underlying driver of cheap financing, are we going to get the kinds of improvement in economic activity that will result in those stronger fundamentals? 
That's going to be an issue in the office sector. It's going to be an issue in the retail sector, in the industrial sector. But there's nowhere where it's perhaps more important than in apartments. And for anyone who is involved in the investment, development, or facilitation of transactions in the multifamily sector, the question becomes even more prescient. Because we need to think about not only how it is that interest rates will change the world, but as the housing market begins to improve. How will gains and improvements in the housing market ultimately impact the outcomes that we observe for multifamily? Is it a sector where we have overbought? Is it a sector where we have overpriced? Is it a sector where we are at risk of overbuilding? Those are questions for which we all have opinions but where ultimately the course of the next couple of years will determine, well, where will that balance end up between things that are good for housing and that are then also good for apartment and the economy and things that are good for housing, but at the expense of the outcomes that we observe in the multifamily sector. And finally, I think for any of us who are watching or you know, have not been able to avoid watching all of the developments that have uh, happened in Washington over the last couple of months, over the last couple of years, Probably the biggest wild card for any of us is the question of how policymaking will ultimately impact outcomes for our sector. It has clear implications for the performance of the economy. And so it has implications for the kind of job growth that we experience. And so it has implications for the kind of demand that we observe for space in commercial real estate markets. But there are also other ways that are not limited to monetary policy, that are not limited to the question of whether we can keep the government functioning. There are specific regulatory and policy choices that will be made over the course of the next couple of years that will impact the cost of capital to our industry, will impact the nature of the kind of lenders that we observe in our industry, will impact the way that we think about how it is that we finance the multifamily sector. And one of the choices, one of the things that we are at greatest risk of naively thinking will be the case for those of us who are involved in multifamily and financing and acquisition and development is that, you know what? When we're thinking about housing finance reform, when we're thinking about the future of the GSEs, when we're thinking about the future of the Federal, uh, of the, of the ha federal Housing Administration, that any changes that we observe are going to be changes that will, benefit for, that will benefit multifamily or that will be designed to be at least sensitive to the kinds of outcomes that we observe in the multifamily sector. There's very little evidence in the discussion that is happening in Washington at the level of the people who are actually going to matter for what those outcomes are that should lead us to believe that anyone who is making the final decision about what happens with Fannie Mae, what happens with Freddie Mac, is cognizant of or is sensitive to the role that these institutions play in financing multifamily sector outcomes. And so that becomes a big question for us when we think about how it is that changes in the policy environment will ultimately impact outcomes in commercial real estate. And finally, and I've separated it out here because it is a question that will persist over a much longer term than these immediate questions of what will happen with interest rates, what will happen in the policy environment, what kind of growth will we experience over the course of the next year. Probably the most underassessed risk or source of uncertainty for our sector today is the assessment of how it is that the way in which we use space is changing. Whether it's in the office sector, whether it's in the industrial sector, whether it's the kind of retail that will survive and that will succeed in an environment where some kinds of retail will not. Changes in the use of space across the different property types is something around which we speculate, but which we must admit is still evolving. We don't know in five years time, in 10 years time, you know, what apartment demand will look like, what office demand will look like, and how the ways in which we use these different sp types of spaces will change, perhaps on a fundamental level, that changes the dynamic force, not only of the kind of demand that we experience, but the kind of supply that we need for these different property types. So to begin assessing some of those questions, I want to divide up my comments into three different categories. First, we're going to talk about the macro economy and the outlook for jobs in commercial real estate, in Atlanta, um, and around the country. I want to talk about the commercial property outlook. Normally, or let's say in the best of times, we would expect that outcomes for jobs, outcomes in the macro economy, our ability to drive the kind of employment and income gains that are going to drive demand for space, that will be the anchor for the kinds of outcomes we see in the investment market for commercial real estate as well. And so as rates begin to rise, again, one of those challenges that we have to face when we think about the commercial property outlook is, well, to what extent have we seen a divergence over the last couple of years? Perhaps not everywhere, but in some segments of the market, between what we're observing with fundamentals and what we've observed with investment activity and the pricing for the assets. Mm 
because there are going to be some markets, there are going to be some market segments where the next couple of years will be about catching up, will be about an environment where if we are to absorb increases in the risk-free yield without seeing property values fall because of higher cap rates, we are going to need NOI growth that is stronger than what we have observed over the course of the last couple of years. Finally, I'll talk about financing. Because as interest rates begin to rise, we can think about this and frame that question in terms of what will happen with cap rates. But a big driver of what we see with cap rates, a big driver of what we see happening with commercial real estate investment quite broadly, is what we see happening in the financing market as well. And for any of us who have acquired assets in the multifamily sector in almost any primary market, or who have looked at the opportunity to buy or invest in an office asset, or an industrial asset in some of those super prime markets along the coasts, where pricing belies the fact that we have had any kind of downturn over the course of the last couple of years. Well, for those investors, for whom maybe the three and a half cap in the apartment sector isn't appropriate, and so as a result, you know, that investor who's broadened his or her horizons to evaluate opportunities to invest in the secondary market, to the extent that secondary and tertiary markets are the investment opportunity of 2014, well, in those markets, the availability of financing becomes an even more critical issue because the investors that have defined the recovery in the biggest markets, the pension funds, the publicly traded real estate investment trusts, the sovereign wealth funds, those investors that have brought the force of capital to bear in the largest and most liquid and most actively traded markets that have taken the leadership role in defining the commercial real estate recovery, they have not largely depended upon the availability of secured financing to engage in their transactions. When we go to the secondary market, when we look at a transaction that is on average much smaller, when we look at an investor that is less likely to be institutional in scale and much more likely to be private, the availability of secured financing, whether it be through CMBS, whether it be through the channel of the community bank, whether it be through the credit union, becomes all the more critical to our ability to sustain pricing and transaction momentum in these markets. What's happened with growth? One of the challenges that we face right now is that the outlook for 2014 and 2015, barring some unexpected policy shock, is better than what it has been over the last couple of years. That's an unequivocal positive in and of itself. But it's also a challenge for us, because when we look at how the debate around the economy is being framed in Washington today, today, one of the things that we are paying less attention to today, because the short-term outcome is improving, or the short-term expectation is improving, is how our economy will perform in the long run. And so one of the things that we perhaps need to focus on to an even greater extent is not just the question of how many jobs we'll be creating next month or the month after, whether or not the government will continue to function in January and February and March, but what kinds of choices have we made over the course of the last couple of years as we've tried to pull ourselves out of recession, out of financial crisis that have longer term implications for the performance of our economy, that have implications not just for how our assets will perform next year and the year after, but how they will perform over our investment time horizon, how they will perform on a generational basis that is going to matter for the next commercial real estate investment market participants. And there, if we look at what the Federal Reserve itself has said, how it has framed its expectations for how the economy will perform, yes, next year will probably be a better year. And that is a positive for us. But when we look at our expectations for how the economy will perform in the long run, over the course of the last five years, little by little, the Federal Reserve itself has moderated its own expectations for the long-term growth outlook for the US economy. And so now we have an expectation that on a long-term basis, our economy might grow at a rate of about 2.35%. In 2009, that number was 2.65%. On a long-term basis, those kinds of differences, although they may seem on the margin for one year or the next, begin to make a big difference. And when we look at the upper bound of how economists at the Federal Reserve believe the economy will perform in the long run today, today's upper bound was the lower bound of the forecast in 2009. So when we're thinking about that question of, well, did we create 200,000 jobs in October? How many will we create in January? We have to balance that short-term view and assessment of what is happening and its implications for our sector with a clear consideration of the fact that not enough is being done to evaluate and think critically about what it is that we are doing right and wrong with our management of the economy.
that when we look at the long-term expectation, the view amongst the brightest economists in the country is that, you know what, we have done something that is impinging upon our long-term growth, growth outlook as a country. It could be the way in which we have encumbered ourselves with greater levels of debt. It could be the way in which we have become less flexible in supporting small businesses. It could be that as individuals, as communities within the economy, as individual actors, as consumers, we are less able to develop new skills as the demands of the labor force change over time. All of those things are going to matter. And if there is one thing that is not being done to the extent that it should be done, it is people asking questions about why it is that we no longer believe that our economy is as resilient and has the same kind of long-term potential that it had even just a couple of years ago. On a generational basis, this matters more for our sector than anything else that is going to happen over the course of a single year or, or over the course of just a couple of years. One of the ways in which we can frame that is that, of course, our thinking about how the economy will grow is secondary to what really matters for demand for commercial real estate space. When we look at it at the highest levels of aggregation, what we know is that it doesn't matter when the economy returns to growth. When we're thinking about demand for space in our industry, what matters so much more is whether or not we are creating jobs. Now, it used to be the case that growth in the economy meant growth in jobs. But for any of us who remember the recession of 2001, we also remember that the recovery that followed that recession was what we referred to at the time as a jobless recovery. And it's because over time, that connection between economic growth and job growth is one that has diverged. And so now, in the modern era, we can observe improvements in economic activity that do not coincide with growth in jobs and employment. And for as difficult as it was in 2002 and 2003, because for more than two years after that recession ended, we still were not consistently creating jobs in the US economy, as difficult as that was, both on a qualitative and quantitative basis, when we look at what has happened over the last couple of years, this recession has been different. It's been different because the economists, the National Bureau of Economic Research will tell us that in mid-2009, the recession ended. The economy returned to growth. In fact, the recession has been over for much longer than it lasted. But when we look at what has happened in the labor market, when we look at the things that matter for commercial real estate space demand, when we look at the things that matter for the average American, when he or she is thinking about, well, is our economy experiencing a robust recovery? The kinds of things that the average American is thinking about when they're looking at outcomes in the labor market, how secure they feel in their job, whether or not we're creating new jobs, those are the things that matter more for our industry than what economists are going to define as the beginning or the end of a business cycle. And when we look at those numbers, what we see is a story that should concern us. Although we are returning to a net turnaround in job growth, the fact that the recession ended in 2009 and that come late 2013, we still have not replaced all of the jobs that we had lost. This is a recovery that has taken, again, on both a qualitative and quantitative basis, far longer than any other recovery in modern US history. The fact that there is that lag, that we haven't been able to get people back to work, to the point, the chart on the right, that even as we have been creating jobs, the kinds of jobs that we've been creating are not of the quality as the ones we lost. And so even since that recession ended in mid-2009, Subsequent to that, we have seen incomes at the level of U.S. households decline by another 4.3%. U.S. households have seen a decline in discretionary income, their ability to support the economy through the channel of the retail sector, because we have not been creating high-skill jobs in the way that we should, to a degree that we have not observed before in the modern history of this country. And when we look simply at things like how many jobs did we create last month, how many are we likely to create this month, the underlying challenge that we face in driving this country forward over the long term, that is a debate, that is a discussion that has been lost. Now, in recognition of that, the Federal Reserve has been able to exercise extraordinary discretion in thinking about creative ways in which it can engage the economy, in which monetary policy can, although perhaps it should not, act as an offset to drags that are a result of what's happening in the fiscal policy domain. 
they've been able to act because expectations for how inflation will constrain their activities have been fairly modest. We can look at where the market's expectation is today, and even now, our expectation and our view is that, you know what, even in spite of the fact that we have grown the monetary base so substantially, in spite of the fact that we've engaged in what, you know, by many measures is more experimental monetary policy than experiential monetary policy. You know, in spite of all of those things, we don't observe significant inflationary pressures. Now, that can change very quickly because part of what drives inflation is people's expectations about what will happen in the market. It's part of why I think the Fed is so concerned in its own choice of language in helping us to believe that we will not experience strong inflation. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If enough people tell you that we won't have inflation tomorrow and they convince you of it, then the wage price spiral that ultimately drives sustained inflation is not something that will emerge in a significant way. And so inflation hasn't been a big concern so far, at least in terms of what we've measured in people's expectations and the current data. That's not to say it couldn't change, but at least for the time being, it's allowed the Federal Reserve to intervene in the economy in ways that we have not observed historically. How much of what we're then observing in the interest rate environment, how much of what we're concerned about in terms of the financing costs and the capital costs for our industry depend upon what is happening in monetary policy. It is not a private market that is finding its own equilibrium. What we see happening with interest rates today in the United States and around the world is largely a function of people's expectations around what it is that the Federal Reserve will do next. The kinds of language that we're seeing coming out of FOMC meetings, the kinds of commentary that we're seeing being made by regional Fed presidents when they give speeches in the weeks after the FOMC has convened. We've seen that financial stresses in the US economy have declined over the course of the last couple of years. But what we can also see is that there's been a greater degree of volatility in the financial stress measures over the course of just the last six or seven months. When we try and disaggregate, well, what are the sources of those stresses? Where is that volatility coming from? Inflections in financial stress in the United States over the course of 2013 have not been related to necessarily what's happening with fiscal policy, have not been directly related to our expectations for how the economy will perform. They've not been related directly to the kind of job growth that we're experiencing. More than anything else, they have been related most directly to our expectations about what it is that the Federal Reserve will do next. And so we can see that when Chairman Bernanke testifies before Congress, when the FOMC convenes in June, when expectations coming out of the September meeting are not what we thought they would be, those are the things that are driving stresses in the financial market today. It's safe to say that although we had originally anticipated that in that September meeting there would have been a signal that, you know what, at some point over the course of the next couple of months or quarters, we will begin to adjust down the extent of interventions in the economy in the form of asset purchases. The Federal Reserve isn't probably going to use the word tapering. They are going to adjust as conditions in the economy change, and it certainly was expected that in September we'd get the first strong signal that they were going to begin to do that. They didn't do it which meant that the market pushed out its expectations. And that has immediate implications for the cost of financing in our sector. Because between May and July, when Treasury rates jumped by 130 basis points over a relatively short period of time, although we have not seen a 130 basis point increase in the cap rates, although we have not seen a 130 basis point increase in the cost of financing, for at least a brief period during May and June and early July, spreads actually widened out before they began to narrow. Because when those underlying treasuries were going up by 10, 20, 30 basis points in any given week, the uncertainty around, well, what will the new normal be? What level will they find before they begin to stabilize? That uncertainty around where it is that treasuries were going in a market where many people didn't expect that they would increase in a significant way at all until 2014 or 2015. Well, in that environment and in that setting, you know, we needed to build some uncertainty premium into the kinds of financing costs that we were observing in the market. And for at least a brief period, those spreads actually got wider. If you closed a loan on a wrong day in June, you may have been paying substantially more than you would pay even just a couple of weeks later. So these inflections and the cost of capital and our sense of what will happen next and how it will impact commercial real estate and the cost of capital for our industry 
are now largely being driven by people's read or assessments of, well, what did the Fed mean when it said this? Or what did the Fed mean or not mean when it said that? Sometimes subtle changes in language are behind dramatic changes in a market that is overreactive to you know, the Fed's attempts to better and more clearly and more transparently signal to us what it is that it intends to do either next or over the course of an even longer period of time. Well, subsequent to that September meeting, when the market's reformulated expectation was one that, you know what, we'll probably see be the beginnings of this tapering in October or perhaps in December. Well, those expectations have changed as well. Because right now, we are in a position of still evaluating what it is the impact has been from the government shutdown and our approach to the budget ceiling. It goes without saying that to at least some degree, there were investments in hiring, in capital, equipment, in consumer goods purchases that were put off because of the uncertainty around what would happen with the budget ceiling, whether or not the government would start to function again, and what its implications were for job growth. And so whereas we might have expected tapering to begin you know, coming out of the October meeting or the December meeting, the fact that the Federal Reserve is now in a position of having to evaluate the impact of those kinds of disruptions and consider the possibility that those disruptions could return in force in January and February when we have to revisit this entire debate, where the outcome of that revisiting might be, again, once again, entirely inconclusive. Those are the kinds of things that the Fed is now having to grapple with when it assesses well, we could begin to tighten. We could remain accommodative. Right now, we want to err on the side of caution and do what we think is in the best interest of economy that requires accommodation. And so the likelihood of a dramatic increase in interest rates that is specifically related to the Fed's withdrawal of its support, you know, that's far less likely today than it was had the government continued to function, had we been able to resolve the question of the debt ceiling in a way that was somewhat more mature than the way we actually chose to approach it. Well, how does the market now price in the expectation that short-term rates are going to go up? Well, from the Chicago Board Options Exchange, we can make inferences about how options are trading and what it means for where the market is pricing the possibility of higher short-term rates. What we see in that white space over there is that come October, you know, and even as far out as July of 2014, you know, in July of 2014, 40% probability assigned to our still having a target rate of 0% for the Fed funds. When we add on then, well, what's the possibility that the Fed funds target rate, the short-term rate will be between 0 and 0.25%? We have to go out to 2015, April of 2015, before the market believes that there is a greater chance that rates will be higher than 0.25% than that there will be a chance that rates will be lower than 0.25%. So at least as far as that short-term rate is concerned, the market's assessment of where the Fed is today, the kinds of fiscal policy drags that we have being exerted on the economy, the kind of job growth we have, the kind of accommodation that we'll observe under a new leadership at the Federal Reserve, the market doesn't believe that those short-term rates are going anywhere in the near term. The long-term yield is something quite different. And it comes back to one of the significant myths of the Treasury market. Right up until May, there were a large enough people, a group of people in commercial real estate who were going to be ready to tell you emphatically, the Fed won't allow rates to go up quickly. The Fed has a vested interest in supporting the economy. And supporting the economy means allowing those long-term interest rates to go up slowly, to go up in a way that is managed. If the Fed exerted control over the long-term rate, over our cost of capital as an industry, then we would not have seen that abrupt sudden and unexpected shift in the interest rate environment between May and July. It is because the Fed does not exercise control over the long end of the yield curve, it only exercises a degree of influence that we saw rates adjust to the degree that they did. The fact that mortgage rates went up in the residential market meant that you know, what we were observing in terms of those interest rate outcomes was exactly the opposite of what the Federal Reserve would want to have wanted to see. Which brings us to the second myth of the Treasury market that bears on outcomes for our industry. And that's that on one hand, the Fed controls those outcomes. But the other is that, well, I'm not too worried about increases in the Treasury yield because Treasuries only really go up if the outlook for the economy is improving. During any normal period of time, Treasuries do tend to move in the direction of our expectations for how the economy will perform and where inflation is going to go over the medium term.
What we do not have today in the United States is a well-functioning Treasury market. What we do have is a Treasury market where the outcomes are by design and quite deliberately yeah, the outcome of significant interventions and manipulations. In the absence of that $85 billion per month that is being spent by the Federal Reserve in growing its balance sheet to buy treasuries and to buy mortgage-backed securities, mortgage rates would be higher. And so what is driving some of the volatility in this market is not a change in the expectation for how the economy will perform. It's a change, again, in the expectation for what the Fed will do over the course of the next couple of months. And that should be a source of concern for us because it means that when we begin to plan, when we're thinking about the stress case for the loan we're about to make or the funds we're about to borrow, we cannot reasonably believe that everything will be within the purview and control of a rational Federal Reserve. It is altogether quite likely that the outcomes that we will observe in the markets will not be ones that will be favorable to outcomes in commercial real estate. And if we don't have some cushion for outcomes in the market to diverge from what we expect or want them to be, then we're going to run into trouble. And there are segments of the commercial real estate market today, as we'll see in a few moments, that will run into trouble because people's expectations for how their assets will perform, for how the economy will perform, for what will happen with the costs of capital. Well, in their segment of the market, they've underwritten their loan. They've paid the price for the asset that is based so tightly in their expectation for what will happen next, that if what does happen next is something different, they're ill-prepared for it. As far as the economy is concerned, what is that baseline outlook then? Real GDP growth improving to about 2.9% on an annualized basis by 2015. That's below what our potential rate should be and what it should look like. Our economy is capable of more than this. An unemployment rate that comes down from an end of year 7.3% in 2013 to about 6.5% in 2015. The unemployment rate, and I think folks at the Federal Reserve will probably be the first to concede this, is one of the most misleading measures of how the labor market is performing. Why do we continue to use it when there's such widespread agreement amongst economists that it masks too much of what is truly going on with the labor market? It's because it is a widely understood um, and relatively intelligible measure of labor market outcomes. All things being equal, it wouldn't be the measure that we're using. Part of what has allowed for the unemployment rate to come down in the United States over the course of the last couple of years has not been job creation. It has been a fall in the participation rate in the labor force to a level that is, you know, again, a source of concern, except that when we look at the policy dialogue in Washington, we find that apparently it's not a source of concern at all. We need to be worried about why it is, apart from demographics, apart from the participation of women in the labor force growing over the course of several decades, why it is today that there are fewer work-eligible Americans who are actually looking for jobs. Why it is that there are fewer work-eligible Americans that have the skills that match up well with the jobs that we are actually creating. We are not doing that, and that matters for commercial real estate. But it's part of why the unemployment rate is coming down, and it's part of why we should be very skeptical when internalizing, well, what does a 6.5% unemployment rate mean for us in 2013? Inflation in the baseline expectation remains relatively modest. When we look at our stress cases, when we look at the outliers, when we look at how their outcomes might diverge, inflation is one of the areas where, again, there's the potential for significant divergence because we don't have a history book from the last couple of decades to tell us what our exit will look like from the current monetary policy stance. There are folks who are involved in monetary policy or who observe monetary policy who will argue that the difficult steps we took were the ones you know, that got us to where we are today. Implementing current monetary policy was a challenge. But there are plenty of other people who will argue that, you know what, don't get too comfortable. Because more than getting us here, what will be difficult is exiting from our current monetary policy position. Lowering interest rates was the easy part. Creating an environment in which interest rates are going to rise in a market where people believe that, you know what, they're not going to go up above 2.5% because we're not experiencing the kind of growth that would be necessary for a rate higher than that. That's a wrong conclusion and a wrong assessment of the historical data. In an environment where we need to begin to pull back on the kind of support that we've been lending to the U.S. economy, those choices, that scenario is going to be a more difficult one. 
the 10-year Treasury yield ending this year at 2.8%. I have to tell you that our projection for the end of year 2013 Treasury yield hasn't changed much over the course of the last 12 months. But early in 2013, there were very few people who would have believed us when we were projecting an end-of-year Treasury of 2.8%. Instead, no, it'll be a smooth track. It'll be one that is consistent with the relatively mediocre pace of improvement in the U.S. economy. Well, none of that's true. And if we look at the historical record, it is just as likely to be the case that adjustments in the Treasury yield will be abrupt as it is the case that they will be smooth and well-managed. So we could see Treasury yields that are significantly higher. And where is it then that in our industry we see some of the most significant risks emerging? It's in an environment where we are lending on the assumption, in some cases, that when my loan matures in five years or seven years or ten years' time, the growth in interest rates or the increase in interest rates that we will have observed will be relatively manageable. The growth in NOI that I will experience will be sort of, you know, more than stellar. It will be enough to fully offset, if not more than offset, the kinds of changes I'm observing in the market for capital. And so I'll be able to refinance an apartment loan that was originated at 3.25%, even if it is the case that after five years' time, I have to refinance that full balance at 6 or 6.5 or 7%. Well, that takes us then to this fundamental question. All of what's going on in this macro economy, all of what's going on with monetary policy, I suggest that you know, the main reason that any of us in our industry really care about this is because of what it means for the way in which we value our assets and the relative attractiveness of commercial real estate as an investment. Well, in that sense, history can be instructive. Let's look at three periods highlighted here where we have observed historically a significant increase in the underlying treasury yield. And what we're going to see is that in the mid-1990s, in the late 1990s, during the dot-com boom, over the course of the housing boom in the mid-2000s, three periods where we either had a sharp and fairly abrupt increase in the underlying risk-free yield, or where we had a longer-term but more sustained increase in the underlying risk-free yield. Well, what happened to apartment cap rates during each of these periods when we aggregate up to the national level? Well, our intuition about how this should work holds during these periods. Treasury yields were rising, but when we look at their relationship to the apartment cap rate, that relationship is fairly ambiguous. Cap rates were not going up as Treasury yields went up because the thing that was pushing the Treasury higher was an improving expectation for how the economy would perform. And as those expectations improved, then you know what that allowed for? That allowed for our risk premia in the apartment sector to narrow to an even greater extent. And so those apartment cap rates were flat or over the course of the housing boom, they even declined, even as the Treasury yield was going up. So their historical precedent for thinking that, you know what, in our industry, we will be able to weather increases in capital costs fairly well. Where we have to make exceptions are on two fronts. One is that, again, it's not necessarily the case that the driver of the increase in Treasury during this historic period is going to be the same as what drives Treasuries higher over the course of the next couple of years. We do not have a well-functioning private market that is free of government manipulation. We have quite the opposite, by design. The other thing that we need to remain cognizant of is that different assets in different places, and depending on their performance, are going to react in different ways to the kinds of changes that we're observing in the capital markets environment. So when we look at the commercial property outlook, and we can take a look at the apartment sector, as our first example, a 130 basis point increase in the Treasury over the course of just a couple of months. What did that mean for apartment cap rates? When we look at the data in the aggregate, we absorb that almost entirely into our risk premia. The spreads narrowed, but we didn't see a significant impact. We did not see that cap rates went up in a way that was undermining to property value. We did not see the kind of appreciation that we observed when those interest rates were declining. And that is a marked change. What happens next? I'll tell you, the next 130 basis point increase in the underlying risk free yield will not be as easy to absorb as the first increase. As those spreads narrow, it becomes more and more difficult for us to simply play them off into spreads that, again, are diminishing. And where does that leave us? Well, over the course of the next year and a half, for the course of the next year, in our baseline projection for the economy, we have another 110 basis point increase in the underlying Treasury yield. And at least at the national level, based on the current trajectory of apartment income and the relative balance of housing demand and apartment performance, we're seeing that that means a roughly 25 to 30 basis point increase in apartment cap rates. Now, as long as you've got an asset 
where income is growing enough. A 30 basis point increase in cap rate does not mean a diminished value. It means a lower rate of appreciation. And that is a new normal that we're going to have to get used to in many segments of the market as those underlying rates begin to increase. The other thing we're going to have to get used to is that the quality of our assets and the performance of our assets on a fundamentals basis matters more. To the extent that we can look at a market like New York that has not been, by any means, the strongest job growth market in the country, that has not been the strongest leasing market in the country, but certainly in the office sector has been the market that has experienced the most profound and dramatic improvement in values over the course of the last couple of years. The divergence of asset prices and demand for those assets in the investment market as compared to what's happening with the underlying fundamentals, that is part of a dynamic where capital has done for us what the fundamentals have not been able to do in the absence of stronger economic outcomes. Well, when we can't count on cheap capital, the fundamentals begin to matter again. And that's going to mean that how our assets are performing is also the thing that ultimately matters as the driver of value. When we look at how, over the course of the last couple of quarters, our assets have responded to changes in the underlying cost of capital, it is not even, it is not undifferentiated. It's differentiated across some lines that are very clear. One is lender and investor density. In markets where, relative to the size of the inventory that's available to invest in, we have the greatest degree of competition, not only amongst investors who are lining up to buy that apartment building, but also the greatest competition amongst lenders who are lining up to provide the financing for that investment. Those are the markets where the competition has allowed for the increases in the underlying risk free yield to be most effectively and efficiently internalized into the spreads. And so when we look at assets, in the apartment sector that were priced above $10 million. Well, in the third quarter, there was hardly any increase whatsoever in the underlying cap rate. When we look at those assets that are less likely to be characterized by institutional investment, by institutional sponsorship, where they are more likely to be characterized by significant degrees of private lending and private ownership, well, those sub $5 million assets those are the ones that face the greatest challenge and the most difficulty in internalizing higher cap rates, even though those were already the assets that had the largest and widest spreads. And so this current argument that has been circulated around our industry for a couple of years that, you know what, well, as compared to historic norms, spreads are very wide, so I have nothing to worry about. For all the institutional investors in the market, for all the institutional investors here today, the markets that we're most active in are not necessarily characterized by historically wide spreads. And in fact, it is in the markets where we observe that spreads are wider that we sometimes then observe a counterintuitive outcome. Those spreads are wider for the smaller assets, for the tier two and the tier three markets, in part because those markets lack liquidity. They lack a critical mass of investors. They lack a critical mass of lenders. In an environment where investors are highly risk averse because of what has happened during the financial crisis, where in that context liquidity matters so much more than it ever has ha mattered before, where there's a good reason to be investing in New York, where there's a good reason to be investing in San Francisco, even if those markets are not the drivers of job growth in the way that North Dakota is, in the way that Oklahoma City is, in the way that Atlanta was not early in the recovery but has become later in the recovery. There are good reasons to invest in these markets that are liquid, even if they're not driving fundamentals gains. Well, in these other markets where the fundamentals may be stronger, the absence of competition amongst investors and lenders as a reflection of the absence of liquidity is something that means that although spreads are wider, they're also the markets that are having the most difficult time internalizing the increases in the spreads. We will ultimately reach some kind of stabilization point where in these markets what will begin to prevail is the fact that rates aren't going to go up anymore from the 3 or the 4% that they eventually find their new level. But where in these markets, if we can sustain the kinds of job growth, the kinds of economic growth, the kinds of dynamism that we've in some cases observed over the last couple of years, well, that can work to our benefit in a fairly significant way. Nationally, the fact that we have not seen significant job growth, that it's been fairly modest, that we've not been creating the kinds of jobs that ultimately result in high levels of discretionary spending, that we've not been creating the kinds of jobs that result in new office space demand. Well, that's been well reflected in the fundamentals. You know, we've seen office vacancy rates that have come down only very slowly. 
seen industrial vacancy rates that have come down, but where we have a significant bifurcation of outcomes. If you own a functionally obsolete industrial property that is not located next to a deep water port or along a logistics channel that is being leveraged by Amazon, you're in trouble. If you own the newest industrial property and you're in the right place at the right time, then you may be doing very well. The best positioned industrial properties along those logistics channels are some of the best performing commercial real estate anywhere in the country today. The retail sector has struggled as well. And my comment up there that the institutional experience is not the experience of the market as a whole is a critical one here. Because so much of the transparency in our market, in the press, in the major national papers, around how it is that our sector is doing, is being defined by what it is that those journalists and those other market observers see. They see what's happening in New York. They see what's happening in Washington, DC. They will write about the very, very large asset that is about to trade or has just traded. They'll write about the, the listed real estate investment trusts that are growing in numbers and market capitalization, the issuance of unsecured debt. They'll write about all of those things where the experience and the outcome is being defined by the fact that we're talking about the highest quality assets and the most privileged subset of investors in our market. When we move beyond those large markets, when we move beyond the large real estate investment trust that is in that privileged position of owning some of the best super regional malls, some of the largest trophy office buildings, and some of the most liquid markets, and we look at the bread and butter transaction of commercial real estate, the $5 million sale, the $10 million sale, in a secondary market or a tertiary market, the outcome and the experience can be quite different. Because those are markets where what is happening with the economy matters so much more. The apartment sector has obviously been the one exception. Apartments more than any other sector, and more consistently than any other sector, those apartments have been doing well. We reached a cyclical low in vacancy rates for the apartment sector in 2012. The challenge here is one that for lenders in the room today is going to be intuitive. And that's when we look at a long history of commercial real estate. What we'll see without exception is that the worst performing loans we make are the ones we make when we are most confident about the outlook for our industry. And the best performing loans that we make are the ones that we make when we are most reserved. The loans that we made in 2009 are not going to default. They were made under you know, duress and under you know, very conservative underwriting assumptions. The ones that we made in 2006 and 2007, when we thought nothing could go wrong, those are the ones that are defaulting at the highest rates of any loans that we're going to observe over the course of the last cycle. That is not new. That is a pattern that repeats itself over and over and over again. If you are invested in apartments, if you are lending an apartment, and you're saying, you know what, we have everything going for us. There is a new normal. The American dream doesn't mean buying your home. It means abandoning your home, even if you don't have a mortgage and going and moving into an apartment building. Well, all of those kinds of assumptions that under some circumstances may seem reasonable, may seem rational, you know, there's issues of degree here. Yes, we have a new normal in the housing sector. It's absolutely true that the way in which we think about home ownership, the way that we finance home ownership, the kinds of home ownership rates that we will experience, all of that has changed. But in the apartment sector, where so many people think nothing can go wrong, if in the apartment sector we are underwriting to the assumption that the kinds of gains that we will see over the next five years are comparable to the gains that we observed when there was no new supply coming online and during the worst and deepest and darkest days of the housing crisis, if the next five years are assumed to be just like the last five, well, those are segments of the market where we are going to run into trouble and where we will see loans default. Not because you know, there aren't a lot of things going for the apartment sector, but because we have a tendency in our market, cycle after cycle after cycle, to grow overconfident when we can see very clearly that things are going well for a particular property type. Well, none of this has slowed the pace of transaction activity. And when we compare 2012 to 2013, it looks fairly flat. But this only speaks to the issue around, well, how can policy intervention help and hurt our industry? You'll remember way back in late 2012, when right up until the 11th hour, there was uncertainty around what the capital gains tax regime would look like come January 1st. There was a huge rush in the large markets to get deals closed before the end of the year. And so we stole closings from the first quarter, brought them forward into the fourth. And so we spent most of the first quarter simply trying to recoup a pipeline of deals to close. 
that depressed activity overall for 2013, not because the deals aren't there, not because we don't have the underlying momentum on a quarter to quarter basis. We can see that we have reestablished the underlying trend of improving transaction activity. It's become more diverse. There are a larger number of secondary and tertiary market trades. We're not as highly dependent upon the apartment sector as we were a year ago or two years ago. We even have land sales and construction activity loans being made in the market. And all of those things are allowing for a greater degree of diversity and potentially a greater degree of stability in the kinds of outcomes that we're observing. But when we see these numbers are flat, that's just about the way in which policy both hurts and helps us. The underlying trajectory is still one that's positive. Where activity has moved from primary markets to secondary, again, we're following a pattern that makes all the sense in the world. It's simply that it's a pattern that has taken a lot longer to play out this time around than it has in the past. When we look at, that was the wrong button. Um, when we look at what's happened over the course of the last couple of years, we've had activity that's been concentrated in the largest markets in the United States. And that's made all the sense in the world because during any recovery, we are going to see that transaction activity and prices and liquidity first improve in the largest and deepest and richest markets. And when we're buying early in the recovery, where those improvements in prices happen earlier and where they tend to be greater in magnitude, if you're buying here, it is unambiguously the case that your return between the time you buy and when the market peaks is going to be greater in that primary market. But we internalize the improvements in prices fairly early. When we look at then what happens later in the recovery, well, the further along that we go, we eventually reach a place where we are today. Enough of the upside has been capitalized into the valuations that we see in primary market that, of course, it makes all the sense in the world that investors, where they can, are looking for a secondary market opportunity. With a lagging recovery in prices, when you buy late in the recovery, then it is unambiguously the case that your upside between today and when the market peaks is going to be larger in that secondary market. Now, the way that it's described, you would think that the largest institutional investors were simply packing their bags and decamping from New York and going to buy two and five million dollar assets in markets that you'd need Google Maps to help you find. That is not what is happening. There is a spillover. But for most of the large institutional investors, investing in that secondary market, investing in that tertiary market, where the weight of their capital is sufficiently large that they could overwhelm and saturate that secondary market. There are only so many large assets to buy once you move away from the coasts, once you move outside of the primary markets. Empirically, when we look at who it is that is buying in the primary market, who is buying in the secondary, and who is buying in the tertiary, we may describe it in terms of a hunt for yield. We may describe it in terms of spillovers. But the character and the mix of actual buyers and investors in these markets, and of lenders as well, is quite different. The largest institutions for whom a trophy asset in San Francisco is appropriate, even if cap rates fall to incredibly low levels, they are not then suddenly scaling down to buy the two and five million dollar property in a market that is not readily accessible to them and where the transaction costs that they face are so large relative to the amount of capital that they have to deploy that they cannot do it efficiently. So we have a different mix of investors. As we make those forays into secondary markets, however, we need to be extremely careful because secondary markets can do very, very well, but for the same reasons that they do well, they can also do very, very poorly. And what you're going to see is that if you look at a list of the best performing economies in the country today, you will find that they bear a remarkable resemblance to the list of the worst performing markets in the country when things aren't going well at all for us. It is because we have concentrations in various industries. It's because Oklahoma City and North Dakota are concentrated in the energy sector, because San Jose is concentrated in technology that these markets are able to do well. Tech is doing well, which means that San Jose is on fire. When tech is not doing well, San Jose can be a bit of a disaster. And what we're going to see in the historical data is that's exactly what happens. The markets that appear most attractive to us, because they are significantly concentrated in a particular industry, they look very attractive to us today. But if we are not cushioned against the reality that those markets tend to have a larger amplitude in their business cycle, that they have good times and then they have very, very bad times. 
They don't have diversity to slow them down today, but they don't have diversity to help them put a floor under their downturn when things go badly. San Jose is a significantly more volatile market prone to much more severe downturns than anything we see at the national level or in any of the larger markets in the country. So as we move to those secondary markets, a cautionary note, the things that are going to attract us are also in many cases going to be the reasons that we will lose money in these markets. Need to be very careful there. Well, what's happening with financing to make all of this happen? Well, a couple of closing points here. Debt yields went up for the first time in the third quarter over the course of this cycle, at least in a, you know, a way that we could observe across the board. Now, that makes sense. They didn't go up by 130 basis points. Debt yields, I think, as a number in and of themselves, don't make as much sense as the inverse of the debt yield. And the way that we can explain the inverse of the debt yield is to simply say, if I was getting a loan in the third quarter, for every dollar of NOI that I brought to the table, how many dollars were you ready to lend me? And what we observed in the apartment sector is that for every dollar of NOI I could generate, you were going to lend me more than $11 in financing. Now that's fine, except that that number's been going up over a period of time where we have started to see that apartment fundamentals gains have moderated. It's not that we're lending more because we think that apartments are accelerating in their fundamentals gains. It's because the underlying cost of capital is cheaper. And that becomes a challenge for us when we look at the kinds of apartment loans that are being made in the market today. Because of the degree of competition, we're seeing a larger number of loans that are interest only. We're seeing loans that are originated at very low interest rates, where if rates were 50 or 100 basis points higher, the loan wouldn't work. We see loans that are being originated on a five-year term. One or two years up front, interest only on a 25 or 30-year amortization schedule, there is no meaningful amortization of that principle. You are taking a loan today at 3 3.5% three with the knowledge that you may have to refinance it at 6 and 6.5% six and on essentially the same principal balance in an environment where you borrowed a lot because rates were low, but where you're not amortizing any of that, and you know what? The NOI that you need to offset the increase in the interest rate is something that you're going to get less of over the course of the next couple of years as compared to the last couple. Even if there is no change in the demand conditions that we observe for the apartment sector, supply conditions are changing in a way that will slow apartment fundamentals not turning them negative, but to what over the long term is going to be a more sustainable pace. And that's an appropriate place to be as long as that's what we're underwriting to. What happened in the commercial sectors? Debt yields down again, a little bit more room to maneuver there, in part because of what has happened uh, with spreads remaining relatively wide. They haven't had the benefit of a subsidy through the participation of the Treasury in providing low cost financing and guarantees. You can see that cap rates as well. Those arrows point to the momentum in the sector, and for office and industrial properties, cap rates were slightly higher. For retail properties, because of the mix of what transacted in the third quarter, they've essentially been flat. When we look at construction financing then, what's happened there? Well, these numbers for construction financing loan to cost actually understate the extent to which lenders have come back to the development market. Because although loan to cost ratios are going up, the actual cost of building is also increasing. And so the number of dollars that we're lending for every square foot, that we're lending for every unit, has increased to a much greater extent than what, you, than what you see over here in these numbers. Now, where is the money coming from? Well, we get a lot of attention, or we focus a lot of attention on CMBS, in part because the data that we get for CMBS is so transparent and so updated with such a significant degree of regularity. One of the biggest mistakes we make in our industry is in looking at what is happening with CMBS aggregating and summarizing those outcomes and then talking about them as if they are representative of what is happening in commercial real estate as a whole. That is absolutely not the case. And the way that we're going to see that is to look at how the loans have performed. The default rate or the serious delinquency rate on apartment loans made by Fannie and Freddie Mac in 06 and 07 and over the course of that legacy period, less than 0.5%. Look at what's the delinquency, the serious delinquency and default rate of apartment loans that were made by banks. They peaked about 10 times higher than that, nearly 5%. What about apartment loans made in CMBS? Well, CMBS apartment loans defaulted at a rate that was nearly twice the bank loans, closer to 10%. 10% for CMBS apartment loans versus 0.5% for apartment loans made by the agencies. Two possibilities. Either the folks involved in securitization have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Or there are meaningful differences in the quality of loans and properties that are 
being bundled into these different channels. Where you get your loan, whether your lender is a life company, whether it's a CMBS lender, whether it's a bank of one form or another, that's not random assignment. It matters who you are. It depends on the kind of financing you need. It depends on how structured it can be. All of those things matter a lot. And we can't afford to be so naive as to extrapolate from what's happening in CMBS and say, well, this is somehow representative of what's happening across commercial real estate as a whole. A majority of the financing for commercial real estate does not come from CMBS. It doesn't come from life companies. It doesn't come from private lenders. It doesn't come from mortgage rates. A majority of the financing comes from banks. And when we look at construction lending, that's even more true. The vast majority of the construction financing in this country comes through the channel of the banks. So what happens with these banks, particularly when we look at the secondary market, begins to matter a lot. A new entrant to this space, a more visible participant, has been the credit union. There, have been, there are 273 credit unions in the United States now that have more than $10 million of multi-tenant commercial real estate loans on their balance sheet. Of those, when you're looking at this segment of the smaller market, that person who needs the one, two, five million dollar commercial real estate loan, they play a disproportionately large role in facilitating that market. And so when you're investing in the secondary and tertiary, your investment may not depend on the availability of secured financing from a credit union. But if you want that one day there should be a buyer for the asset that you are going to sell, then you need to know that there's going to be a credit union, that there's going to be a community bank, that there's going to be a conduit lender, because in the absence of those lenders, you don't get to decide when it is that you are a seller. And that's probably the biggest and most tangible difference that we see in the market today as investors begin to think about that transition. What defines a primary market versus a secondary? In a primary market, you can decide today that you are going to be a seller. Maybe not at the price you want, but today there will be a buyer and there will be a lender. In a secondary market, you don't get to choose when you sell the asset. Someone else does. You are dependent upon the arrival or the presence or the participation of a willing buyer before you can part with your asset. That is a fundamental difference in liquidity that separates the primary from the secondary markets. If you don't have absolute discretion over the period during which you are invested in that secondary market, if there will come a day where today you must be a seller, then the secondary market is not an opportunity for you. CMBS is active in these markets. Unsecured REITs are still, unsecured debt issued by the REITs is still fueling what's going on in some of the largest markets in the country. The legacy performance of the loans is improving. And we're down from a peak default rate of 4.4% to now just 2.2%. This is part of why banks and other lenders in the market are able to lend again. It's part of a dynamic relationship. The availability of credit allows for transaction activity, supports price discovery, means that prices are going to be rising. When prices are rising, we're able to lend more and our legacy pools start to perform better. And that process feeds on itself. And it's just now starting to move from the largest markets to some of the smaller markets. We've seen the same pattern for construction loans. Here's what's critical to remember. When we think about the lower default rates, for anyone who's still looking at an opportunity for distress, there are two reasons it's still there. The larger part of the decline in the default rate in commercial real estate has not been because we've worked through distress. It's because we've been lending more. And so when we look at the change in the balance sheet position, yes, distress has come down by $38 billion over the course of the last couple of years. But net new lending is up by $82 billion. So when we think about what share of the loans outstanding are in default, that number has come down. And for every two basis points that it's come down, more than one has been attributable to the fact that we're simply growing that denominator. There are more new loans out there. Less than half of it has had to do with the fact that we've actually worked through some of that distressed pool. And you can see that in the way that distressed loans that have been restructured have ultimately performed. Even in the vaunted multifamily sector, more than a third of loans that we have restructured over the course of this recovery have come back to default once again. The rate of recidivism is extremely high. And that's instructive for us as well. If we buy into this idea that there is a wave of distress coming in, or that there's simply a wave of maturities coming, yes, there are a large number of CMBS loans that are going to mature over the next couple of years. A lot of them are going to face real challenges in finding new financing and finding new equity, even if we are very flexible. The primary lever that we've been able to pull in managing distress over the last couple of years has been uh, the availability of low interest rates. 
that fundamental underpinning, that fundamental condition that has defined the way in which we have engaged with troubled borrowers is something that is going to be less supportive of outcomes over the next couple of years as some of these CMBS loans mature. The fact that we have recidivism to this degree in the market is also instructive. Because whether we're thinking about this from the perspective of a lender or investor, when we look at what is actually in those pools of loans that will mature over the next couple of years, if you are a lender with a high underwriting standards, not a lot of these are going to be loans that you're going to want to make. If you're an investor in Atlanta and another primary market, not a lot of these properties are going to be properties that you're going to want to buy. And that becomes problematic for us when we think about what will happen over the next couple of years with these subsets. It becomes an opportunity for the distressed investor, unlike the opportunity that they've experienced over the last couple of years, where that low cost of financing has been part of the story for why it is that we've been able to observe an almost complete recovery in values in some markets in spite of the fact that fundamentals remain an open question in those same very markets. What happens over the next couple of years as we lend more? Well, default rates continue to come down, both for commercial mortgages and for multifamily mortgages. If there is a challenge that we are embedding in the future of the market based on the activities we are doing today, it's because in some segments of the market we are pushing too hard and underestimating the extent to which increasing interest rates will impact the viability of the refinancing opportunity. Because we all know how to discount cash flow, we also know that when we're doing our stress scenario, that back-ended risk model that is saying, you know what, it's not term risk, it's about whether or not I'll be able to refinance in five or seven years, well, that very large cost that doesn't happen until further down the road, after you discount it, just seems to matter less. And until our models adapt to take account for the fact that, yes, we've got risks, they're just not the same risks that we had the last time around. The most famous phrase coming out of the downturn, we're not making the same mistakes as last time. We're not underwriting to prospective cash flow. No, we're not making those mistakes. We're making all sorts of new ones. And those new ones include a lack of cognizance around how it is that we are going to refinance loans and maintain the values of properties that in some cases have depended too much upon the availability of free capital and not enough on the presence of strong underlying fundamentals and economic activity. Well, the lending will remain in place in part because we're told that it will. When we ask lenders in the third quarter, how is it that you're responding to higher interest rates and cost of capital? Probably the most surprising takeaway is that overwhelmingly they tell us that, you know what, at least in terms of debt yields, unchanged, or I'm going to allow them to fall. Those spreads are continuing to narrow. So yes, we have a world of challenges. I think about risk all day, so it's a large part of what I see. The story on the whole is one where lending remains robust. It continues to improve. Interest rates are rising, but our industry expects that we'll be able to weather those changes well. Do we need to make sure that we're identifying assets and investment opportunities where income will continue to grow? If it's low today, we can position the asset for better performance tomorrow. Those things matter more now than they ever have before. But is the future bright for commercial real estate in spite of the fact that the fundamental underpinning of the recovery is changing today as compared to where it was just a couple of years ago? Absolutely. Thanks very much. I'll just take a few questions, and if you wouldn't mind just repeating the question. Sure, absolutely. Sir. Will we have a formal recession before the next presidential election? Our baseline forecast says no. However, um, where we have uh, stress cases, a lot of what defines our stress testing of loans right now and, of, you know, and, and, and on the investment side as well, relates to uh, what happens from policy shocks. So there may be recessions that are either isolated ge geographically or isolated on a, recession on a sector specific basis. An abrupt change in the way that we finance multifamily assets because of housing finance reform. And it would be naive of us to think that the people that are most deeply ingrained and embedded in that process are ones that have a vested interest in outcomes for our sector. Well, you know, if that is an abrupt change, if it's one that is not sensitive to you know, the impact of you know, changes in the cost of capital to, uh, to the apartment sector, you know, then you know, on an isolated basis, yeah, we could face a problem there. Will we face sort of a broad recession uh, that's sort of economy-wide? You know, the precursors, the preconditions, or the triggers for something like that are going to be a default on the debt ceiling. Uh, 
they're going to be a decision to uh, you know uh, allow the government to stop functioning for an extended period of time in a way that you know is going to matter on an on a sort of a geographically or spatially focused basis for DC it matters all over the country just because all sorts of things in the private sector all sorts of you know private contracts can only happen with some degree or element of government participation so our ability to be private market participants is impinged when the government isn't functioning it's under those kinds of circumstances. Based on the underlying trajectory, don't see a recession. So, right, is, is there a point where, you know, through, you know, one channel or another, through, you know, irrespective of how it actually plays out, that we actually see that the debt ceiling doesn't go up or that, you know, even if it does, we actually, you know, draw spending down. But the best way for me to answer that is to say that, you know, again, in our baseline forecast, we don't see Washington getting smaller. but as a tail risk in our distribution. So this is a low probability event, but one that proves to be very costly. There is a tail risk you know, for investors in Washington that Washington does get smaller. Um, because it's a political issue and not an economic one. Well, it is an economic issue, but the decision process is not certainly you know, a rational one. Um, the challenge that we face is that we can't assign a discrete probability to it. We can say that it's of unknown probability, but the consequences are significant. And um, you know, the, you know, it's really one of the discrete outcomes for that is that when we look at the way that apartment loans are being underwritten, you know, the ones that were red flagging at the highest rates are actually multifamily loans that are being made in Washington today. Because they're being, you know, the best apartment loans in DC are being underwritten in a way that doesn't differentiate them from the best loans that are being made in Manhattan. Over a long-term basis, it's unlikely that we'll be able to sustain the same kind of fundamentals improvements in DC that we will get in Manhattan, where the supply constraints are more embedded. Um, there's certainly very little cushion against tail risks when we're looking at how assets are being priced, how um, loans are being underwritten in DC. What that tells us is that, you know, at least on a market basis, the market doesn't believe that things will change. I know I've probably over, oh, 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 yeah, gone, gone over my time. So uh, oh, one more, one more thing? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> is, is an economy that's, uh, that's uh, largely centered around consumption activity, uh, you know, one that is sustainable over the long run. Um, domestic consumption activity as a long-term driver of growth in the United States uh, has a sort of, you know, a dim prospect, let's say, because the kinds of jobs that we see ourselves creating um, are, are not necessarily the ones that are going to result in you know, large uh, gains or improvements in discretionary income. If you know, the preponderance of job creation in the United States was job creation that was related to high skill labor, high wage paying jobs, you know, significant sustained increases in productivity, if we were getting richer in real terms, that could allow us to sustain an economy that was really driven you know, by domestic activity. If we're in a scenario where we're less flexible as a workforce, where we just don't seem to recover from downturns as quickly or as efficiently as we used to, where we've got some fundamental problems, uh, where we have lots of startups in the country, but the relationship between startup numbers and job creation isn't what it used to be either, uh, then uh, you know, without a strong consumer, we need to look elsewhere for drivers of growth. Um, identifying what those sort of you know, uh, export opportunities are uh, you might remember a couple of years ago, during the State of the Union address, the president said that one of the goals was, I believe, to perhaps double or uh, significantly grow uh, uh, U.S. export activity or, or the contribution of exports to uh, U.S. economic growth. Um, it, it's a fine objective. It's a fine goal. Um, the, the devil will be in the details. How are we going to get there? What is it that we are going to make that other people in the world want to buy? I apologize for overstaying my welcome. Um, should I? Long-term outlook, you know, so, some of the challenges that we have here in the United States, uh, and sorry, to, the, to repeat the question, you know, uh, if Europe is our largest export partner, uh, you know, what does that bode for U.S. exports? Uh, you know, Europe is certainly in a challenging situation. Um, it's hard to see how over the next four or five years they'll perform as weakly as they have over the last four or five. So in the aggregate, you know, conditions are improving. There's also some potential for improvements from, um, you know, from liberalization of trade. There's some free trade discussions between uh, a bilateral basis between the European Union and the United States uh, that you know can help to you know open up those economies for our exports. Um, but again, it comes down to you know a couple of really fundamental things. One, are we going to make things that they want? 
Um, and you know, the iPhone on its own isn't going to do it. You know, that can't carry us forever. Uh, but the, you know, are we going to make things that they want? And um, you know, from a demand perspective, even if the European economy is growing, the kind of it's a very mature set of economies. And the kind of long-term growth that Europe will experience, both in terms of economic activity and population and households, is very, very modest. Um, you know, if we want to look for an export opportunity, it's going to be in some of the faster growing emerging economies. Those are not easy places to go. Lots of friends that want to invest in India, no one actually makes any money investing in India. Um, people want to invest in China, it's hard to understand or know exactly how it is to navigate that market and reappropriate your gains. Um, so, you know, there, there are real challenges in sort of, you know, exploring a wider arena. Europe looks very, very familiar, uh, but for some reasons that are good and, and, and some that are bad. So the, the question relates to a couple of different things, the, and I think the central one is you know, the debt ceiling, that it keeps on, you know, it continues to go up. I think that you know, we've relied in the United States on an assumption that we can continue to borrow at very low costs. Um, and that is a reasonable assumption if what drives our thinking about it is that, well, no one believes that we're going to default. Uh, that will probably hold true over the long run. Our financing costs do get more expensive. People don't have to believe we're going to default. Uh, we can look at the, sh at, the, at the Treasury yield curve between September and the end of October, and what we'll actually see is that the one-month Treasury, for a brief period, had a higher yield on it than the one-year Treasury, which is not how it should work, and that's a pretty good signal that something's not working correctly. And it's not that people believe that the U.S. would default. It's that they, you know, when they were thinking about buying a one-month Treasury, they weren't sure that we would figure out in time for them to recover their investment in the one month. So those yields shot up. It was, you know, you needed you needed to get a stronger return on you know a thirty day investment than you did on a one year. So, you know, during any given period of time, you know, the world is ready to believe that you know, we don't work out our problems efficiently um, and quickly, and that we will let our problems impact the rest of the world. They don't believe that they're going to persist. If you look at the ten year and the thirty year, they went down a little bit during this period. Um, the problem is the underlying assumption that we're going to be able to finance cheaply, even if no one believes we're going to default in a way that you know, is challenging for everyone around the world over a long period of time. Our yields are going to go up. Why is it that yields have been on a real basis for the 10-year? You know, negative. We've had, if, you've, if you bought treasuries at 1.4%, your return was essentially negative. Well, what's going on there? I mean, basically, you know, throw out your textbooks. Part of what's happening is that you've got investors all around the world who, you know, during the depths of the financial crisis, are not necessarily worried about appreciation and upside. They're worried desperately about capital preservation. And they're buying treasuries knowing that they're getting a negative return. That negative return is essentially a fee that they are ready to pay to the U.S. Treasury. And in return, the U.S. Treasury is going to make sure that their principal is still there tomorrow. And that's why people have been willing to buy it at these very, very low yields. Over time, the rest of the world starts to look a little less risky. The greater the distance we put between ourselves and the financial crisis, the less risk averse we are. But people will require higher yields for this risk-free investment if there are other great opportunities out there. That pushes our yields up. And this is the last piece of it. As our yields go up, the reason it matters is because not only new debt, but servicing our very large existing debt, it all gets more expensive. That matters because then for every dollar in tax revenue that we bring in, a larger and larger and larger share has to go to servicing the debt instead of to other things. So depending on what you believe, you may believe that the right thing for us to do if we had the wherewithal would be to lower taxes. Or you could believe we should leave taxes where they are. And what we sh should be doing is expanding dramatically access to education, access to healthcare, access to daycare. It doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. The larger our debt, the less able we are to do any of these things. And that means that as we bring in these tax dollars, we're constrained. And there's a very basic premise in you know, Economics 101 that when the government taxes, it distorts outcome in the private market. And that crowds out private investment. The more we have to tax to do things that do not support productivity in our economy, the less viable we are as an economy. And that's part of what you see happening in those Federal Reserve projections. The Federal Reserve is concerned that, you know what, we're not going to get smart about this, we're not going to grow up, and that's a problem.
Right. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll round it off here. But you know, the, the fact that we've got this growing principle is absolutely an issue. The way that we're going to think about it is that when our, GDP, when our debt is relatively low relative to GDP, we can continue to grow it as quickly as the economy is growing. If GDP is growing by 3%, we can grow our debt by roughly 3%. Right now, we don't have a balance there. We're going to try to get it back into balance. To get it back into balance over the long term, we need structural reform. It's not rocket science. Trying to, if you look at the federal budget, it's pretty clear what we need to do. Right? There isn't a lot of discretion there. Now, there are some very clear programs that consume the vast majority of uh, everything it is that we're spending on. Right? We could get rid of everything that we spend on except paying for our wars and meeting our uh, entitlement obligations. Everything else goes. Commerce Department, education, all of it. All we do is pay our entitlements and fund the wars. We still would not balance our budget. Right? So something fundamental has to happen. Will we be able to continue to you know, pay the debt if it grows at a faster rate than the economy on an indefinite basis? Probably the most dangerous thing that we can do in the US economy is to say, you know what? We will be able to do that indefinitely. Now, we're still in a position where we're in control of our fate. If we allow this to go on forever, eventually someone else will control our fate and be making those calls for us. So with that, I'll uh, let you go. Thank you again very much. Thank you all for coming.